Klaus, I have known you for a long time and I am always so inspired by how professional you act, the playing standard you, that you have set in all styles of music. As an educator, we just visited many of the students at Dinkles Buell at the, at the university here. It, it's amazing to see that you continue to inspire everybody at a high level. Where did, where did music start for you? Where did it begin for you? <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, it started where it starts with everybody. You have to love it. You have to, you have to feel a, a, a true and honest love for what you do. In, in case you don't have that, <laughs> stop doing it, stop playing, do something, do something else, I don't know what, but you, you really have to love it. Uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, I would say it, it started very early on that, that I discovered there is a, a, a talent for music hmm. and um, uh, so, so I'm, I'm coming from a very musical family I guess so my father was playing both of my grandfathers were playing interesting um, my my brother was uh, uh, was was playing tuba trombone and uh, and horn and uh, and I really think he was pretty good at it so <laughs> so I, I still to the very day I, I would assume there would have been chances for him to to be a professional player, but it was never, say, a goal for him. So so he never took that, that choice. That journey of what he did. Interesting. Yeah, wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Well, from there, we, we always had a set of drums at our house because my godfather, would, would you say? Yes, absolutely. He played the drums. <laughs> and uh, and so, so there were drums at the basement of our house. And this is how I got infected with playing the drums because nobody else in the family was playing drums. So, <laughs> so I was the only one. And... Uh, and I didn't take lessons until I was, say, 10 or 11, mostly for the fact because uh, uh, I was afraid that I had to learn to read music. <laughs> Which was, like, in, in the aftermath, like, completely ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, but uh, then I, I, I got the idea, okay, I, I think I can do it. I'm not that bad at it. And uh, things evolved and, uh, well, today we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, w w was there music played in the household? Was there music around? Sure. So, so my uh, my father and my brother they were playing in the local brass band, right. and uh, and back in these days they would even rehearse uh, at our house in the like in the basement, and uh, I was and the and the room where the drum set was that was only only just the other room, and I at, at times I would try to join them and bash the drums as they were rehearsing, which they did not always like. <laughs> But uh, but that's uh, how I started pretty much in, in a local brass band playing everything like between waltz and marches and and of course then also having to read music at a certain point and that helped you out when you finally learned how to read music absolutely yeah, because uh, uh, you know because if you if you don't know what you're doing and if you can't read music everybody can tell you something. Do this, do that. Oh no, that's not correct. You got to, you, you got to do it this way. Oh no, you got to, you got to hold your sticks the other way. That's all wrong. And uh, until I said, this, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I, I, I need somebody who tells me how it's done Absolutely. in in the right way. And that really uh, put my playing on a on a much different level because at that point I was the person uh, who would decide this is correct. I know I didn't do good on this one, but I know how to improve that, and, and now I can find my own path Absolutely. without listening to people who don't know any better than I. <laughs> <laughs> so what, were there any bands that you liked listening to as you were getting a little older? Were there musicians that you loved hearing? Oh, yes, and, and, and like my first teacher, he, uh, uh, he exposed me to a wild arrangement of all different kinds of things, and, uh, uh, which would also include he would give me records, Mm. that he would listen to, of course, then also. So it was like, I, I can remember times when, when he would give me uh, In a Mounting Flame. Nice. Which completely Ooh. changed Billy Cobb, something. John McLaughlin. This aye, is. Aye, 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 aye. And the next week he would give me uh, uh, Pat Metheny, American Garage. Nice. So to the very day I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest Pat Metheny fan. Interesting. Although I have no idea how to play guitar, but I just admire the style and that personal voice that, that Pat has. So I think it, it, it goes back to these days when I discovered that, that you have to develop your personal voice. You have to be something 
individual on the on your instrument, no matter what you what instrument you right. play. But yeah. but there has to be some sort of personal voice that you have. And uh, and I always had a had a strong admiration for people who had that personal voice, no matter if they would play tuba or drums, you name it. Absolutely, I, I, I don't care. But you really you really have an extremely unique and personal sound. Your setup is unique. You're playing, of course, open-handed where you're playing in that, that freer technical process, yeah. Yeah. And it, which is amazing what you've done. So was that a gradual evolution? How did you come across all that? With open-handed playing? Absolutely, or? with open-handed playing, because that once, once with the open-handed playing kind of changed the setup of your drum set, and that opened up a whole other voicings yeah. of what you do. Yeah. Now that also goes back to, to these early days with the brass band and, and with that first set of drums that I had, yeah. which was a Trixon set. Uh, so I'm not sure. You, absolutely, you, you know Trixon about was absolutely it all so set. It was yeah. a, a German company located in Hamburg. Yeah, and I still do have the the pedal that came with the uh, with the set, <laughs> which was a, a sonar pedal. That's an antique. A sonar made it, that. Pedal. It was a sonar. How pedal. interesting! Yeah. yeah, from the early '50s, and uh, it had a bass drum which was like I don't know twenty and a quarter of an inch, something like that. <laughs> so it, it was not really s straight. <laughs> Straight inches, like 20, 22, as we have it today. It was somewhat in, in between. And uh, it had one, uh, uh, one rack tom, <laughs> and no floor tom, and there was one cymbal, which was a, a paiste, which, came, which was on a rod that came out of the bass drum, <laughs> and a pair of bongos. And I still do have these bongos. They were black with palm trees on it, but there was no hi-hat. So my first set of drums did not have a hi-hat. It was only much later when my father brought a, a hi-hat from that brass band, uh, from from their former set of drums that they would not use anymore. So he said, "Son, I I, I got something for you. Here it is." And I said, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sat down and I played like this. Interesting. So these were the the, the first steps. Then you go to the rehearsal of the brass band, and people say, "Oh, that's that that's not the right way to do it. You got to cross over." And what? So, so, so there was all kind of all kinds of uh, misinformation or, say, different information, and I did not know how to handle all that. Right, right. And uh, but there was definitely uh, some sort of uh, exposure to open-handed playing, as I, I just chose to play like that because nobody told me. Absolutely. And um, well, then it was only much later, in like in the beginning '90s, when I first met you. Uh, and uh, when I was playing the, the, the drums only competition, where yes. you were one of the judges, I was one of the judges with, with Larry London, wow. who was still back in the day, and Gary Chafee <laughs> yeah. was in there, and Udo was in there, <laughs> no Domin, and yeah. yourself. And uh, well, shortly after that, uh, um, I, 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 that was also the time when I met Chapin, and Chapin was always a strong believer in playing open hand. Absolutely. Yeah, and then in 1994, when I first started with you. You really like changed a lot of it back to the open-handed position again, and uh, and I just took to it. So, but you took to it so well, and you know we, we know you know Billy Cobbin was one of the first to do it, and then Simon Phillips did his thing very differently, and you've done your thing very differently. And what's amazing is the books that you've written, the open-handed playing one and volume two, where Cobbin writes the forward in one, and Simon Phillips writes the forward in the other. It's amazing that you you have taught this idea and you've opened the mind of the world to see the options of different playing techniques that have given freedom to thousands of drummers around the world. I see this as I travel. This is so incredible. Boy, <laughs> thank, thank it, you. But it, 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 it really is. It, it, it really goes back to, uh, to stuff that I wrote for myself in, in, in the journey of uh, fine-tuning the, 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 the skills that I wanted to have in right. the open-handed position. So it was more or less not really that I wanted to write a book, but it was more or less exercises that, that I would create for myself. Right. And this is why I think the, the, the books work so well. Absolutely. And here are these books which are very ahead of their time to a large degree because now young kids are looking at this and seeing the future of where they can go with drumming. But what you've done that's so great is you've gone back to the old colonial, you know, rope drum concepts of books that you've written and concepts that you played. What got you involved in that kind of historical drum playing? Well, it, to a certain degree, it was also Chapin because he, you would, you would ask Jim about any event in history, no, <laughs> no matter at what age it happened, <laughs> it, uh, and Jim would he know something about it. He was a brilliant man, yes. Yeah. 
truly really a genius, but yeah. you, you, you know that even better than I do. Yeah. Um, so, so Jim was a big fan of it, and of course, uh, back to the, to the tradition of Sanford Moeller, who was a big fan of, of that colonial, yeah. open, rudimental style of playing. And uh, of course, it also had to do with, um, with the aspect that, uh, uh, that Jim one time also uh, went to the, uh, to the Fasnacht in Basel, yeah. and, and he really liked that a lot. And, and he, I remember him talking about that. Um, but uh, I mean, even here in Europe, there's not too many people outside Basel who know, who know at our, but yeah. Basel drumming. It really is the, the, the cradle and the hotspot where the, the, the phrases that we know as rudiments actually came from or where they derived from. It's parts from France, it's Switzerland, it's certain parts of southern Germany. And just recently I heard about a place in Belgium which, uh, uh, and which also has a carnival and they have a, a, a snare cadence that is like uh, th that stays within the family. It's not written down. Uh, Passed down from generation from to generation. From generation to generation. Wow. So, yeah, so I've, I, I got to figure out that. So it's, <laughs> it's mostly for, for my uh, uh, love for, 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 the, for the history of drumming. And, uh, and as you just mentioned in, in the sessions panel, it really has a lot to do with looking back and seeing what was it that the people did before you came. Right. And, right. and I, I, I'm not sure if, if it was you who once said, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess it was you, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's really the truth. It really, it's important because, you know, and, and we talked about Jim Chapin, and I want to talk a little bit about Jim, because Jim Chapin was a character and a figure that was so big and so brilliant. He had genius IQ, and he was just an amazing person. Just tell a little bit about Jim and how he affected you. To be very, frankly speaking, uh, in, in the beginning, uh, beginning, I did not really know uh, what to think about it. Because, uh, I mean, of course I had heard of, of, of his book and, and that, that's Jim Chapin. That's Jim Chapin, okay, I see. And uh, um, so I took a lesson with him and, uh, and it was, I mean, from, from, from a today's standpoint, uh, I was very unreflected with that. I just, I just did what Jim told me and I had no <laughs> idea whatsoever where this could take me. The only thing I would see back then was, okay, here's an old man who I don't really know, but uh, it seems he knows such a lot about the drums and it seems he knows such a lot about how a stick works in a human hand. Mm -hmm. And he, it seems he has so much to say and I just don't question anything of what he says. <laughs> I, I just try to imitate that. Good. And, uh, and, for the, and for that first period of, of learning and studying from Chapin, it was exactly that position, that mental position I was in. Yeah. And I'm forever grateful that I did not question <laughs> the things he, he told me. And that was one of the biggest things for my personal development as a player, because uh, when I was seriously studying with Jim, and then like 10 years later or so, people were starting to, to like rave about molar technique and by that time, I already had like my ten years Absolutely. experience ten years of, into of playing it. and and seeing and, and having Excellent. experienced how Jim would teach the system, yeah. and uh, so that was incredible and it was an, a major advantage. Yeah. But that's great that in Germany, because in in America, the information I mean, it was in the late '60s and early '70s that I started being familiar with who Bowler was, mm -hmm. and by having Jim live there. And it was Jim traveling, but you really seeked out the information. That's one thing that you do, which is so amazing. You find out what, and you seek it out, and you stay on it until you pull from that what you know will open your mind. That's a quality that's really special. And you have an incredible business skill, too, that you are able to organize all the books that you've written, all the different clinics that you do, the teaching you're doing, having your band, performing at different festivals, doing different camps. You are doing everything that can be done in the music industry and at a very high level. How do you maintain that level of artistic and business, you know, you know, like, like, it's just, it, it, how do you maintain that? It's, it, it's fantastic. Well, it's, it's like w one thing feeds the other, really. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if, if, I, if I know that, that I can improve my playing by researching and understanding the, the, the historic side of drums in a, in a better way, uh, which ultimately makes me a better player, right, right. that does something to, to the way how I see myself. I should not be the person to say that, but, but, but I think I'm a very humble person. So All the time. I, I will Always. not go out and, and, and say, 
listen guys, you should listen to me. Yeah. That, that's not me. Yeah. It, it, I, yeah. I would yeah. never say something like that. But, uh, but from that standpoint, I always wanted to, to strive for more and, and to be a better player and to really push the limits of, of, of my potential. Yeah. So by becoming a better player and by seeing more of the potential that I have as a musician, that helps me uh, to, uh, uh, to have a certain position as I negotiate with organizers right. or with companies right. because that really helps me, okay, I have to say something. There is first class information, I have to say something, I have uh, my individual voice on the instrument. Right. I know what I'm doing and, uh, and from that perspective that also helps my playing with the band, like yeah. with Flux. It's, uh, it, I, I enjoy playing with, with, <laughs> with, with that trio. Uh, because the, the focus is not too much on me and it, it's more about the music. So right, it's, right. it's not really drum music in, in that right, sense right. where the drummer writes the songs, which nobody ultimately wants to hear. <laughs> but, uh, and even that music reflects my, uh, um, reflects the, the, the way how I think about the mixture of things that happened in the past right. and what happens today. So it's right. not really like a, a, a Hammond organ trio as you would think of it like in the, in the 50s or 60s. Right, right. We use the, those vintage sounds and, and we all have that uh, background of, of jazz playing, but we all love the Beatles and we are the greatest <laughs> Pat Metheny fans, all the three of us. So that kind of makes a nice mixture which, which makes our, our project unique, I think. Who came up with the name Flux? Where did that come from? Well, it, it, I think it was mostly Paul who came up with that <laughs> to, to express that idea of uh, flow. Yeah. And uh, so flux, flow. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I should ask him if, if he has another story still <laughs> to it. But, but, uh, but I, I guess it, it was about that. And the first record, of course, was, uh, was about the element of water. Right. So, so that went together with that flow. And we thought, okay, our music should have that special flow. and. Uh, and, and that state of feeling yourself in the flow as you create and take risk on the stage, that always has to have a certain flow. And just like water, which can be mixed with all kinds of things, and water can be like life-saving, but it can also be life-threatening. Absolutely. It can like rain down, or it can be frozen, or it, it can <laughs> be all kinds of things. Yeah, you can right. mix it with wine, although you should not do that. <laughs> so it can do a lot of things, just as a different mix of music or of styles of music can, can be a reflection of, of what you can do with, with water. In closing, what would you say to the next generation as students and young excited musicians watch this in years to come, what would you say to them to, to inspire them and give them hope to continue being in the music industry? Well, first of all, uh, as I, I, I started with, with that quote where I said, you have to love it. Yeah. You simply have to love what you do. And unless you don't do that, give it up. Right. <laughs> you, have, you have to feel that passion and that, and that obligation to, you, you have to feel I have to play music because anything else is not an option. Right. You, you have to overcome any sort of obstacle that keeps you from, from what you Right. love the most, right, right. which is playing music. And, uh, and fighting to overcome these obstacles, I see, is a very important quality. Yeah. And it, 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 it doesn't say like fighting in, in terms of put your elbows out and, and, and put away all the other guys. Right. Because ultimately it's about being together in this, in, in this process. Of, I mean, it's not just me or, or you or right. any other musician. It's the entire community of yeah, musicians yeah. that that should overcome this this elbow like thing so it's like a personal fight you have to have that personal fight in you yeah, to want to it's, achieve it's it's taking risks it's it's uh, having that perseverance to 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 do that extra step that nobody else wants to do right 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 and once you do that at a certain point you will succeed i'm sure <laughs> i'd like it if you if you could Summarize that now, but do it in German. Okay. Eigentlich ganz einfach. Ihr müsst, ihr müsst lieben, was ihr da tut. Ihr müsst, ihr müsst diese Passion und diese Leidenschaft, die ihr für Musik spürt, so sehr lieben, dass ihr bereit seid, jedes Hindernis zu überwinden und den extra Schritt zu machen, der euch 
ans Ziel bringt und wo ihr realisiert, nicht spielen und nicht Musik machen ist keine Option für euch. Ihr müsst das tun, weil euch irgendjemand oder irgendwas diese Gabe mitgegeben hat und äh, ihr müsst es tun. Es gibt keine andere Wahl. <laughs> no other choice. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. You know, you have been blessed in so many ways. You have been blessed with a beautiful family, beautiful children, a wonderful wife, and you've got this great opportunity that you are continuing to perform and teach and share what you're doing and what you're still learning with thousands of musicians around the world. Whenever I travel and your name comes up, it's always at a very high standard. For that, I thank you because I still learn from you. This is the journey of what we do on behalf of the sessions. Klaus Hessler, thank you so much. You are the best. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> Excellent.